Have you ever wondered why the great majority of the people on earth remain so ignorant? Why only a small fraction of the people really succeed at anything in life? Plato gave us the answer 400 years B.C. He said, Neither do the ignorant seek after wisdom, for herein is the evil of ignorance, that he who is neither good nor wise is nevertheless satisfied with himself. He has no desire for that of which he feels no want. Isn't that about it? I think the great Spanish teacher and author, José Ortega y Gasset, carried Plato's wisdom right into the 20th century. He points out in his excellent book, Some Lessons in Metaphysics, that even though human knowledge has experienced an almost unbelievable growth during the past 100 years, most especially during the past 50, the great majority of the people have not only cut themselves off from this great growing body of knowledge, they have become, if anything, more barbaric than they were before. And he explains why. The only way a human being can get to knowledge is through study. Ortega y Gasset compares study to paying taxes. It's something people don't like to do, and something practically no one does when he doesn't have to. The great majority of people will go to school just as long as they have to. During that time, they will learn only what is absolutely necessary, which isn't very much, and they will stop on any subject the moment they're allowed to. That's why we have the mind-boggling phenomenon of a multi-billion dollar school establishment and a nation of people with barely enough useful information to find a seat of their pants with both hands. You see, that answers a question that bothered me and perhaps you too for years. The question was, how is it possible in a nation as modern, in a society as advanced, in a standard of living as high as it is in ours, for a human being to reach the age of 50 with so small a collection of useful information? Never in the history of man has a nation offered the opportunities for learning as has the U.S., and had those opportunities as systematically ignored. Succeeding in the free world, and most especially the United States, is not difficult. All we need to do is obtain a fairly good education along the lines in which we're interested, and it's free. We're surrounded by it on every side. It lurks in readiness in our public libraries, in the extension courses of our fine schools and universities. And the great majority of the people sit dull-eyed and slack-jawed in front of their TV sets and occasionally querulously complain because they're not more successful, or tell a British research team they'd like a 20% increase in income. By far, the great majority of them are overpaid as it is. But they have what we want. We have only to find ways to serve them better. They are the world's champion consumers. If they devoted a half hour a night to continuing education, they could be the world's smartest people, too. But they don't seem to know about that. Nor do they seem to know that there's freedom and fun in knowledge. As I mentioned earlier, if there's one thing that typifies our society, it's boredom. Apathy. Whenever you find boredom, you find the absence of a good idea. And whenever you find the absence of a good and exciting idea, you find a person who isn't using his equipment anywhere near par. In the excellent book, The Nature of Man, there appears the line, Man tends to achieve his being inasmuch as he develops love and reason. Now, there's something worth thinking about for the next 20 years. Man tends to achieve his being inasmuch as he develops love and reason. Love and and reason. Here's where our hope lies, our opportunity for service, growth, and fulfillment. How are we doing in the love department? How good are we when it comes to reason? I think that great line should be made into a little sign that we should put up in our kitchens. It would be a good idea to have it on the visors of our cars as we drive to and from work. Love and reason. And on the job, too. Love and reason. It's hard to improve upon, isn't it? It's the way to transcend the grubby commonplaceness of existence. You know, the most important step a human being can take is the one that leads to transcendence, even a little transcendence. In the same book, The Nature of Man, we read, transcend is a tricky word. Let's give it its full meaning by trying to encompass its different specific meanings. Transcendence may be used in a religious or metaphysical context as indicating the existence of a higher power. Transcendence may also mean a liberation from egotism and selfishness, and thus an attitude of openness and real communication with others. Transcendence may finally mean, and this especially in existentialist thinking, a going beyond oneself in time, a reaching out of oneself toward the future. However, one thing is common to the different meanings of the word. Going beyond our self-absorbed ego, freeing ourselves from the prison of egotism and relating ourselves to reality. Once the term has been defined, it seems clear that life has a meaning if transcendence is achieved. If man does not limit himself to the selfishness and destructiveness of the mirror created by Narcissus, to give oneself is the only way of being oneself. 
this paradoxical sentence is only paradoxical in appearance. It can be found in the teachings of the Upanishads, in the Gospels, in the Vedas, and among others, in the writings of Plato, Aristotle, Kant, Goethe, Marx, Schaeller, Russell, and Machado. Transcendence is a goal worth working toward, and within the reach of anyone. By getting above the dismal, narrow life based strictly on the ego and learning to give of ourselves to our work, our families, and our play, and by so doing become ourselves, we solve our three major problems at one fell swoop. How we spend our days, our family, our income. Our days will be full and richly rewarding. Our family life will take on new love and meaning, and our income will take care of itself. By really giving of ourselves, we will be maximizing our service which will automatically maximize our rewards. It's not an easy thing to achieve, but worth working toward, and it can be done in balance, without rush, by getting our priorities straight and organizing our time. An early start helps. Living in balance helps our appearance, too. We tend to look younger when peace and confidence radiate from us. It's been said that everybody's face is his own fault after 40. It reflects the real person inside. I spoke of learning to play golf earlier. My good friend, the well-known golfing writer Gary Wyron, tells of a man in San Francisco who jogs 6.7 miles every morning. That's the distance around Golden Gate Park. He also walks five miles to and from work. He works as a banquet waiter, boxes a couple of times a week, and tosses in eight or nine games of handball. As you can imagine, he's in magnificent physical condition. He's also 103 years old. His name is Larry Lewis, and he began running in 1876 at the age of nine, and he's been running and keeping as active as he was at that early age ever since. He's made the comment that you should never refer to a person as being so many years old, since old often means something dilapidated. Larry Lewis doesn't intend to become dilapidated, especially during his second 100 years. Gary Wyman suggests that each of us should ask himself these questions. Are my muscles getting soft and flabby? Do I feel chronically tired and dragged out? Am I clumsy performing physical tasks which once were relatively easy for me? Can I feel and see unsightly bulges of fat on my body? Do I have to stop and catch my breath after climbing one or two flights of stairs? Is my physical zest for life missing or rapidly failing? If you agreed to more than a couple of those questions, you may well become a victim of premature aging. Here's another great contributor to the cardiovascular plague I mentioned earlier. It isn't that we want to live forever, or even as old as Larry Lewis may be, although I think it's a great idea if you're enjoying life, but we can ward off premature disease and avoid looking like 200 pounds of chicken fat in a polyethylene bag by spending just a few minutes a day exercising. I do. I hate it, but I do, and I find it gets me off to a pretty good start. Much better than when I don't exercise. I've never been a physical fitness nut. But I believe we should take care of our bodies just as we should our minds, and to get the best use of both takes exercise. Gary Wyman says that in the absence of crippling disease or chronic disability, there is no biological or physiological reason why a human being need deteriorate markedly until well past the age of 70. Most people don't lose the battle against premature aging. They simply never wage it. Sir Adolf Abrams once made the comment that everybody wants to live a long time, but nobody wants to be old. Or to a surprising extent, it's possible. Gary Wyman goes on to say, With daily exercise, you'll not only look better with stronger and firm muscles and have a more attractive figure and posture, you'll also sleep more soundly, experience less listlessness and fatigue, be able to release pent-up emotions, increase your endurance and capacity for work, enjoy better health, greater longevity, and possess an improved self-concept. It's estimated that only 4 to 5 percent of the adult American population exercises regularly. Why? Why such an anemic figure in the face of such consequences? The answer lies in the placement of priorities. Our scale of values is cockeyed. Think for a moment. What would you trade for good health? Can you think of anything you would trade for good health? I can't, because with health we can do anything and enjoy it. Every morning I face the chore of exercising. I do it in my dressing room adjoining the bath. I hate it, as I said. It only takes a few minutes. I feel great when I get into the shower after exercising, and I'm glad I do it after I've done it, but I hate to start it. Once I start, I'm okay. It's like getting started with this typewriter of mine. I look for any little excuse to delay it, put it off for a few minutes, but once I start, I'm okay. No one can make you exercise every morning but yourself. It's an excellent exercise in self-control, too. 
It's truly amazing at how quickly the body responds. Before you know it almost, you'll look years better. You'll have a flat, hard belly and good muscles. Your wind will be good and your step brisk and, well, it could add many years to your life. I read an estimate not long ago that 80% of all deaths are brought on by obesity, overweight. Now, exercise won't take off weight, although it will redistribute it to some extent. Only eating sensibly will have you at your proper weight and keep you at your proper weight. You can eat the same well-balanced meals, just eat less. Take off two pounds a week until you're at your proper weight, then get on the scales every morning without fail. If you've gained a pound or two, take it easy on the groceries. One of the hardest things for most of the population to learn is that food intake must match energy output. When we were in our teens and early 20s, we usually had high energy output and had to eat a lot. In fact, we formed a habit of eating a lot. Now, habits tend to remain constant or actually increase with time. So chances are a given person will continue to eat the same amount of food, or even more as he grows older, and as his energy curve begins to go down. The spread between his descending energy curve and his food intake line will be represented by the spread of his waistline and the seat of his pants. The normal human stomach is about the size of your clenched fist. Before you begin to eat, look at your clenched fist and then eat that much food. End of good health department. You know, we're learning that we took a lot of things for granted which simply are not true, not as we thought them to be. We thought we were educating our children by sending them to our schools, and we've discovered that we have a nation of uneducated people. We thought mankind was moving upward and onward and found ourselves living in the bloodiest century in the history of human civilization. We thought our technology and progress would give us better health, especially with two chickens in every pot, and find ourselves in 20th place in the world health picture. We thought our new higher standard of living, our new wealth, would give us a world free of crime, and we have a national crime picture that makes you want to run for cover. Lots of opportunities lurking in there for a thinking person. And here's a creative thinking problem for you to work on if you like. If you were to lose your present source of income tomorrow, how would you live for the next 12 months? Quite often, military commanders in the field are reprimanded or demoted for falling victim to a surprise attack. It's happened many times. Well, each of us is the commander of his own life and family's defenses, and it's the duty of an intelligent commander to be prepared for any eventuality he can imagine. Now, every member of our family should know what to do, where to go instantly in case of fire. With the crime rate what it is, we should make certain our homes are as secure from unlawful entry as we can make them. It should be high on our priorities list. And we should have a good plan to put into action should our income stop for one reason or another. A woman dying on the roadside as a result of an auto accident was asked why she had failed to fasten her seatbelt. Her last words were that it wrinkled her clothes. Here's a typical, though tragic, mix-up in priorities. We can get our clothes pressed. The sudden loss of income gain is an interesting one for the whole family. Most women tend to be ill-prepared to fend for themselves, not just married women, but young girls just out of school. Most families don't seem to realize that the average woman who marries in our society will work at a job for 25 years. If she doesn't marry, she'll work for 40 years or more, just like a man. And knowing that she must, in all likelihood, work at least 25 years, even if she marries, you'd think most girls would prepare themselves for interesting and well-paying work. Not so. Most young women come into the job market with skills limited to driving a car and talking on the telephone. They're not too good at those. This is true even of most women who go to college. They come to the world of work with no marketable skills and thus put themselves at the bottom of the economic heap. They also miss the fun of a meaningful career, and they have no ace in the hole in case their marriages don't work out, or the husband dies, or in case they'd like to get back into the swim of things after their kids have grown up and moved out, during the so-called and often aptly called empty years. A woman can be married for 20 years, lose her husband because of death or separation, and still have nothing whatever to bring to the labor market. In 20 years, she could have become expert at anything, playing the piano, interior, decorating, selling, retailing, teaching, nursing, secretarial work. Think of the way she could have become a typing and shorthand in 20 years. Yet as a rule, she does nothing. She comes to the world of work with a dazed expression on her poor, scared face and with wringing hands. Why? Suppose you tell me. She'll most likely say, I didn't think it would happen to me. Why not? It happens to millions of women every year. How about a little preparation? A few minutes a day add up quickly. Do you know that you can turn out the equivalent of a novel every three months by just typing four pages a day? 
The cumulative effect of a little time well spent every day is almost unbelievable. There are hundreds of excellent courses that can be taken. I think it all comes down to the fact that most human beings form the habit early in life of doing no more than they absolutely have to do. They miss the fun of learning, the fun of achieving, beyond the simple chores of their days. When the kids are young, preschool, they occupy all of a woman's time. But once in school, she can usually find time, just as a man can, for some independent line of study. Now, why should we do all this? Why go to all this trouble? Why not just sit down and turn into a kumquat? Well, it gets back to what Gerald Sykes and other experts have pointed out. The worst guilt of all is the guilt of not having become our true selves. The pervasive discontent we see on all sides is triggered more often than not by the inner knowledge that life ought to be better, more fun, more exciting, more interesting. And it should. And it can be. When we bring more of ourselves to bear upon it. When we find more of our real talents. When we reach into the deep reservoirs of ability, even genius, that lurk in each of us. Emerson wrote, Intellect annuls fate. It means that to the degree that we use the brains we were born with do we move toward freedom. To the extent that we do not think and learn, are we dependent upon fate, circumstances, chance. A person's freedom depends upon the extent of his thinking. The extent of his thinking might be said to depend in large measure upon how successful he has been in cutting himself loose from the superstitions and alibis and misinformation many of us grew up with. I've long believed that the nagging discontent observable in the lives of so many rests on the fact that they seem to think that there's an easy, effortless way to succeed in life. They forget the rule about opposites. And seeking what appears to be the easy way out, they actually make life more difficult for themselves. By following instead what in the beginning appeared perhaps the more difficult route, the route to knowledge and self-discovery, and by taking what might appear to the casual onlooker to be a considerable risk, it turns out that in a dozen years, years that pass quickly anyway, they've taken the better, and in the end, the easier, safer, more satisfying way. Sooner or later, we must realize the truth of Gerald Sykes' marvelous statement that any solid achievement must of necessity take years of humble apprenticeship and lead to estrangement from most of society. Let me repeat that statement. Any solid achievement must of necessity take years of humble apprenticeship and lead to estrangement from most of society. I think we all know how true the first part of that statement is. Always be suspicious of the so-called quick success. Even towering geniuses usually don't reach their best work until after many years of seasoning and dedicated experience. If it comes easy, it usually doesn't amount to much. But what about that part about leading to estrangement from most of society? To become great at anything is to be a nonconformist and cut oneself away from the great majority even of those in one's own field. The great businessmen, the great professional people, the great educators are all mavericks. The late Dr. Abraham Maslow, former president of the American Psychological Association and the founder of the third force in psychology, kicked over the traces. They thought Marshall Field was crazy, and every really great leader in every field has had to go it alone for a time at least. The person who waits for innovations and ideas to come from others in his field, which is what 98% of the people in every field do, can never be better than second best. He's got to be a follower. A conformist. It's true in banking, in industry, in medicine, education, in every field. You can't go along with the crowd and amount to very much. The two simply don't go together. My old friend Dr. L.D. Pankey of Coral Gables, Florida, comes to mind, the father of occlusal rehabilitation and dentistry, who now travels all over the world teaching his marvelous methods to others. We often see murals in public buildings which depict great masses striving upward toward the sun. It may look good, but it's pure fiction. They not only don't strive upwards, they generally resist whatever good ideas do come along and throughout history have tried their best to torture, maim, and kill those who have tried to lead them out of their grinding ignorance. We can love people, humanity, in the sense of agape, unselfishly, and with a real desire to serve. We can and should love mankind as our brothers and sisters if we can pull it off. But the best known way on earth to never amount to a tinker's dam is to lose oneself in the crowd. As Will Rogers said, whenever you find yourself on the side of the majority, it's time to reform. So it's true. Any solid achievement must of necessity take years of humble apprenticeship and lead to estrangement from most of society. Peter Drecker, in his excellent book, The Age of Discontinuity, points out that historically the men of knowledge have not held power, at least not in the West. They were ornaments. 
If they had any role at all at the seats of the mighty, it was that of court jester. There was so little truth historically in the old adage that the pen is mightier than the sword that it can only be called the opium of the intellectuals. Knowledge was nice. Knowledge was a solace to the afflicted and a joy to the wealthy who could afford it, but it was not power. Indeed, up to recently, the only position for which knowledge prepared was that of servant of the mighty. Oxford and Cambridge, until the middle of the 19th century, trained clergymen. The European universities, civil servants. The business schools in the United States, set up less than a century ago, have been preparing well-trained clerks rather than entrepreneurs. But now, says Drucker, knowledge has power. It controls access to opportunity and advancement. Scientists and scholars are no longer merely on tap, they're on top. They must be listened to by the policymakers. They largely determine what policies can be considered seriously in such crucial areas as defense or economics. They're largely in charge of the formation of the young, and the learned are no longer poor. On the contrary, they're true capitalists in the knowledge society. Salaries have gone up fast in the schools. The man of knowledge also increasingly has earnings opportunities outside of academia through research grants or as a consultant. Drucker goes on to talk about the responsibilities that go with power and mentions that our faculties are chuck full of able-bodied people who stopped working the moment they made associate or full professor and got tenure. People in the education industry are much like people everywhere. There's a tendency to do no more than one must and then wallow in the resulting discontent and alienation. That's my comment, not Drucker's. But the point I'm trying to make here is that the age of the dummy with muscles is past. We've learned that there needn't be a dichotomy there either. Some of our greatest athletes are top students, and the day of poking fun at the bookworm or the good student went out with the ice truck and the rumble seat. Surveys have even discovered that girls prefer men who wear glasses. They say glasses make a man look more intelligent. They're interested in brains, not biceps, although the two, as I mentioned, quite often go together. So an hour a day, improving your mind is the best exercise habit you can form, and one that pays big dividends in all three of those important departments of life. In one of his plays, Pulitzer Prize-winning playwright Archibald McLeish has one of his characters say, The only thing about a man that is a man is his inker. Everything else you can find in a pig or a horse. Yes, intellect annuls fate, and fear is ignorance. And speaking of good quotations, here's a good one from the pen of the American writer Christopher Morley. There's only one success, to be able to spend your life in your own way. Here's the dilemma that faces most kids in school. How do I want to spend my life? What should I choose to do? What can I do that will fill my life with interest and bring me the particular rewards I'm looking for in life? Christopher Morley's definition might well be carved over the school entrance. There's only one success, to be able to spend your life in your own way. A leading business executive resigned from one of the world's biggest companies to take over the business school of an American university, and he commented that a man ought to uproot himself every 10 to 12 years or so. Morley's definition might mean doing that. It's no longer necessary to stick with one job for life. The Blue Cross people reported recently that ours is the first generation of human beings to experience a middle age of 30 years instead of the old 15. It's true. It used to be Tutkins in every pot, then it became two cars, more recently two homes, and now two families. More and more people are starting a new child or two in their 40s when the first group moves out into college in the world. I was talking with a friend of mine the other day, and he told me that only about 3% of all American Armed Force veterans have taken advantage of their GI Bill educational allowances. I remember reading that the employees of Macy's department store in New York had grumbled because the company had been hiring executives and managers from outside the company. So Macy's management put in a free management training program for employees so that it could promote from within the organization. Only about 3% took advantage of the training, even though it was free. All they had to do was stay after work. That 3% figure keeps popping up in cases like that. It seems that only about 3% of the people are seriously interested in investing a part of their time and energy in programs calculated to help them get ahead in the world. The rest yell and flail around for pay raises and more fringe benefits, but when it's suggested that they might do something to improve themselves, make themselves more valuable, upgrade themselves with the times for their own good. Uh Uh-uh. No, the old slogan is still, take it easy, but take it. Many years ago, there was a cartoon which appeared in the Saturday Evening Post, which depicted two men in the mid-thirties sitting at a bar with drinks in front of them. One of them is saying, I want to burn with a hard, gem-like flame. I want to scale the heights, storm the citadel, reach the top. Then there's a pause, and he says, Not a heck with it. I mentioned Dr. Maslow earlier. 
Based on his research, growth toward self-actualization is both natural and necessary. By growth, he means constant development of talents, capacities, creativity, wisdom, and character. Phrased another way, growth is the progressive satisfaction of higher and higher levels of psychological needs. In Maslow's words, man demonstrates in his own nature a pressure toward fuller and fuller being, more and more perfect actualization of his humanness in exactly the same naturalistic scientific sense that an acorn may be said to be pressing toward being an oak tree. It's easy to see in children, but so often apparently lacking in adults. Psychological growth leads toward psychological health. A person can grow out of his psychological problems and hang-ups just as he can outgrow his clothes. We tend to distrust our natural instincts. We've often been taught that our instincts are bad somehow. Moreover, the growth process requires constant willingness to take chances, to make mistakes, to break habits. One can choose, says Maslow, to go back toward safety or forward toward growth. Growth must be chosen again and again. Fear must be overcome again and again. Maslow also advanced what he called the Jonah Complex, the tendency in adults to doubt and even fear their own abilities, their own potential to be greater. As he put it, we fear our highest possibilities as well as our lowest ones. We're generally afraid to become that which we can glimpse in our most perfect moments, under the most perfect conditions, under conditions of great courage. We enjoy and even thrill to the godlike possibilities we see in ourselves in such peak moments, and yet we simultaneously shiver with weakness, awe, and fear for these very same possibilities. The pleasures of growth and development require effort, self-discipline, and a certain amount of pain, but they're worth a thousand times what they cost. Are you familiar with Murphy's Laws? Edsel Murphy is an electronics engineer who's made some significant contributions to the understanding of the behavior of inanimate objects. One is that any error that can creep into a calculation will do so, and that error will be in the direction that will do the most damage to the calculation. Another is that all constants are variables. In any given computation, the figure that is most obviously correct will be the source of error. In the area of production, Murphy's Laws go like this. Any wire cut to length will be too short. Identical units tested under identical conditions will not be identical in the field. A dropped tool will land where it can do the most damage. That's also known as the law of selective gravitation. A device selected at random from a group having 99% reliability will be a member of the 1% group. If a circuit cannot fail, it will. A fail-safe circuit will destroy others. Components that must not and cannot be assembled improperly will be. The most delicate component will drop. A transistor protected by a fast-acting fuse will protect the fuse by blowing first. After the last of 16 mounting screws have been removed from an access cover, it will be discovered that the wrong access cover has been removed. After an access cover has been secured by 16 hold-down screws, it will be discovered that the gasket has been omitted. After an instrument has been fully assembled, extra components will be found on the bench. Hermetic seals will leak. The probability of a dimension being omitted from a drawing or plan is directly proportional to its importance. Dimensions will always be expressed in the least usable term. Velocity, for example, will be expressed in furlongs per fortnight. Murphy's Laws. I found that they also apply to keys. If you have the right key on a ring of four keys, the odds are not 25% that you'll use the right key first. They're more like one one-hundredth of one percent. And when you want a particular tool for a particular job at home, that particular tool and only that tool will be missing. It will make its reappearance the moment the need for it is passed. People who underestimate their ability to think and solve problems should familiarize themselves with recent neurological research. Work at the UCLA Brain Research Institute points to enormous abilities latent in everyone. In fact, the Institute points to an incredible hypothesis. It seems the ultimate creative capacity of the human brain may be, for all practical purposes, infinite. Russian scientists have been amazed by the enormous reserve capacity of the mind. Writing in the journal Soviet Life Today, the eminent Soviet scholar and writer Ivan Yefremov said, Men under average conditions of work and life uses only a small part of his thinking equipment. If we were able to force our brain to work at only half its capacity, we could, without any difficulty whatever, learn 40 languages, memorize an encyclopedia from cover to cover, and complete the required courses of dozens of colleges. A statement like that makes us realize how we formed the habit of living in low gear, getting by, as Huxley once put it, without too much discredit. 
It's been found by researchers such as Dr. Maslow that people who live close to their true capacity have a pronounced sense of well-being and considerable energy and see themselves as leading purposeful and creative lives. Isn't that what we all want to do? Thank you.